Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Today I'm with yet another KXP radio host. I've had about like four or five now. Really? Yeah. Damn, that's dope. Yeah, Supreme, uh, Kevin Deers, quite a few. Quite a few. Dope. And uh, he's also a, a rapper and a producer. He was in the group The Flavor Blue. It's my pleasure to have on Lace Cadence. My man. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. So I've heard people call you Isaac. Would you go by Isaac or Lay? That's what the is government. The... <laughs> That's the government. The, the yeah. government. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I like my name. <laughs> Isaac's a cool name. Yeah. People that know me well, or it's usually people that have known me for a while. Got it. Okay. Call me Isaac or Ike. But and what is what is the uh, the meaning behind Lace Cadence? Damn, Lace. It's a cool one because mm. when I was young, I, my tag was Lace. I grew oh, up doing graffiti. Were t- okay, that's awesome, yeah. man. So I was I was writing Lace, and then I started getting into rapping, and I I think it was. It was during high school we was having a cipher and I was really inspired by like Twista and fast rappers. Mm-hmm. So my cadences were always like I, had to, I tried to come with some crazy cadences. Yeah. And my homie's like, "Oh, lace cadence." So and then I just There we go. It was I said, "Yes." What part of Seattle did you grow up in? I grew up in the CD. Okay. Yeah, Capitol Hill in the CD. There yeah. we go. And that's like uh for people who don't know, that's a very like uh it's like a diverse but solely like focus kind of on work the african community they even yes. have like africa down there yes and are you mixed or what are you yes my dad's senegalese my mom's swedish irish okay so i'm i'm a i'm a mutt and you've been to senegal oh yeah many times because you're like you're really into like afro you're getting the afro beat scene now. that's what i do for a living now and yeah. when, did, when did that come about like you didn't start there right not at all it came about when i started to research my dad's mm. history because he didn't know anything about it and it just always I always had a lot of African culture around me just Mm. because he was always very interested in it. So I started to research it Mm. early 2010s and it just led to me being like, oh, I want to know more about it. Yeah. Once I started doing that. When did like Afro beats become like a popular thing? Has it always been around? It's just like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's a fair question because it's became popular like on a world scale pretty recently, Mm -hmm. you know, but it's been around for a while. Got it. At least 15 years of like, you know, pop Afrobeat type music. Got it. And like, what would you say the origins of that is then? <sighs> That's a tough one. People like the band, people like, there's a lot of like people that were doing it way before it became known. Mm-hmm. So like, if you know about the, the early days of Nigerian kind of pop music, those guys are kind of the godfathers. Got it. Yeah. There's a uh, dude, he has Maven. He runs a ma- label called Maven. And he's like one of the OGs that's like collected talent through the years and has always been like, yeah. Said, uh, like when I think of Afrobeat, I think of like Burna Boy, Burna Boy and yeah. like WizKid, but I'm guessing there's probably way more. There's a people lot to are, offer. Yeah. There's a lot to offer. So, like, who are like some of like the, do you know any like the pioneers of Afrobeats? Yeah. I mean, like I said, the band I feel like mm-hmm. is one of them. Um, P Squares, there, there's a group called P Square and they were like the twins and they were like, they're known as the first people to like start dancing and have like, the origins of kind of what you see now. Yeah. They're kind of known for having one of the first hits to kind of break out like that. Got it. Um, but then, I mean, you can keep going further, further and back and back. But a lot of people say Fela is like the, you know, he's the legendary godfather of Afro beats because okay. he's the first to like coin the name and kind of have that rhythm of music, Nigerian. But I'm guessing so. like Afro beats couldn't have been around until there was like Dawes and being able to produce. Yeah. Or... But I mean, Fela's of... known as like the godfather of Afro beats, and that's just all live band like music. Okay. So if you do your research, you can kind of see how they tie together. Right. It's he's known as the originator, like from the '60s, '70s. Oh. You know what I mean? Okay. So like, what makes up? What makes an Afro beat an Afro beat? That's this. It's a funny question because <laughs> it's basically it's you. This you could get a different answer mm. f- for this from different people. I feel like, but yeah, Afro beats is just African music. Hmm. That's pop. I feel like current pop music. Got it. Afro beats is like kind of our right now. It's kind of like our trap or our R and B or our like what's popular here for like those type of urban people. That's Got what's it. going on in Africa. It's like just Afro beat. So if it's it's becoming popular in like America, does that mean by the time it's popular here, you guys are already like switching kind of the sound in the Africa? The sound or? doesn't change. No, that's why I like it too. Oh, <clears throat> pardon me. The sound doesn't really change. It's just getting popular here. Got it. But it's still all Africans making it. It's still that's why I think it's cool because it's it's keeping its origins. Like it's still always hasn't been like bought out and like washed out. Got it's it. still just like. So would it be weird if like a white person started doing Afro beats? Like you know, like who was that? There was a couple <laughs> years ago, this like white guy won a Grammy for making reggae music. Ah, oh, I forget that, that guy's name. Damn. 
Do you hear about that? That's weird. Ah, I forget what I mean. Was well, a group or something? It was like this white. is a slippery slope. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because music, I feel like it's hard to. I don't like to look at music like racially. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like music is just cool. It's music. It's for everybody to share. Got it. Now, of course, it's culturally based, but then it's like that's where it gets slippery because. Right. What about the the? I feel like it's almost more of like a not. I don't think conspiracy is the right. More like a, maybe like a rumor that like Charlemagne kicked uh, Post Malone out of making hip hop music, you know? Like, so there's, I guess there's some still barriers well, what in like. What happened to Post after he did that? He fucking, Phew. yeah. So, I mean, you know what I mean? It's, a good example is this dude, Costa Titch, actually, rest, rest in peace. He just passed mm. away like this year. Oh, man. And he was like 20, he was a young kid. South African kid. Ama Piano is, we could talk about Ama Piano if you want, but it's a South African genre of Afrobeat. Okay. It's really blowing up right now. It's like probably the most popular form of African music. Um, and he was like really popular, but he, no one, until people, they had no idea he was white, mm. but he's South African. And he grew up around, like he just grew up around all the homies. Like he was South African. Yeah. And he grew up in the same areas of like what you would consider, you know, a lot of black South Africans are there too, but that's just his culture and that's what he grew up with. Right. So a lot of people would see it and they'd be like, because he has braids and he mm -hmm. has like a bandana on and, and he can dance hello well and he's just like very confident and like doesn't come off like. So he he was the basis of a lot of conversations about is this cool or not? Right. And I was always on the side of, I mean, what what is he supposed to do? Mm -hmm. He's that's where he's from. Yeah. He's literally just representing his culture. So like, what made you interested in like understanding your culture more? Because I feel like there's a lot of black people who don't really know much about their culture, and that's why we're just labeled as like African American. Right. Good question. I, I think most people will come to some point where they'll want to. I mean, if you want to know about your ancestors and like mm -hmm. your who you are. Yeah. Personally, it's just like you'll come to a point. Some usually at some point that you'll want to know more. Got it. So I, I think everyone comes to it at a different point, though. And that probably like brought you closer with your family no question got it yeah my dad passed away this year oh man i'm sorry yeah. to hear that it's yeah it was pretty recently in october um and i was trying to take him and he never got to go so it's like now mm. it's like very important for me to to go be in senegal where he was from mm -hmm. always just learn more about the culture i'm starting to learn wolof the senegalese language so oh wow it's just important to me to like because he really wanted to know about it because he had no idea right like he grew up in cincinnati during the civil rights movement like oh, he shit. was not they didn't they didn't talk about that right um so he was really never never able to do like a 23 and me or whatever like find out his for that generation they didn't really know much mm -hmm. <clears throat> if it wasn't shared so yeah it's just important to me to like continue that because i know he would have wanted to mm -hmm. and, and he can't now and i would have done that either way but there's just more of like a basis to it for me so when was the switch between you learning and you starting to share because i'm the kxp thing hasn't always been around so was there no, different ways you did it before yeah, that's, I've had this show for almost three, year, three years now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I was doing Afrobeat DJing. You know, I've been doing it for like six, seven years now in the city. Mm -hmm. And when I started doing it, there, was only a f there wasn't much of it going on. There's mm -hmm. definitely people that were doing it uh, and had things going, but it was not like popular. Right. You know, like it was cool to find, oh, you got an Afrobeat event going on. Cool. Now it's like they're all, it's everywhere. Right. Yeah. So what did, what did that start out like? Like were you in like small clubs or did you have a name to the point where you could play that type of music? Or? I was doing small like personal, uh, not personal, like small like distinct events, like mm -hmm. Afrobeat events. Got so it. So I would start like small rooms, just try to get people in there. Because I started at, uh, one of the first nights I did was called Trap House. It was a Thursday night mm -hmm. and it was at Sugar Hill. And it was probably, it was I think it was one of the first Afrobeat nights to be like on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. Like literally. <laughs> and that's, I guess, at that time, what was the type of like, audience that you would bring in? And was, has it changed now? Or? As soon as all the Afro, as soon as, because I, well, I had help because I had a few Nigerians that were down to help me like start it. Yeah. <clears throat> so that helped because as soon as I got a few of them like to know I was doing that and playing that type of music, then the community just starts like coming. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's another cool part about it. Like if they know something's going on, like a lot of different yeah. communities will pull up. Just you don't have to be out. from this country. It's just like, oh, there's an Afrobeat event. Cool. Like a lot of the Africans they'll come yeah in some cases i feel like it's hard sometimes when you're an up-and-coming artist to try to promote yourself and get your events out there but in other cases word of mouth really spreads in seattle too that's one cool thing about seattle you can promote that way mm -hmm. if you get enough people talking about it people will pull up yeah 100 yeah. percent. yeah it's but it's like finding that it's not easy it's not 
But if you can find, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that is the thing for me. Like it's African. It's it's so like people in the culture want to be. Oh shit, that's going on. I'm about to pull up. Mm-hmm. That is the niche kind of to it. And then when did you? How old were you when you started getting involved in music? Oh, super young. Got I've it. been doing music my whole life, honestly. Yeah. Dang, how old were you? Like, were you? Was it like in high school? Oh or? no, I mean, my mom got pictures of me like playing paint cans, like in diapers, like trying <laughs> to make drum, trying to make drum kits, and like playing paint. Yeah. Like I was always interested in music, and then what type of music? Like, because you said you were a rapper, also. So that's like the first type of music I made. But I grew up around like jazz, Fela Kuti, mm-hmm. a lot of African music, um, a lot of like Beatles and stuff like that. My mom, my mom and dad would play their shit, and it would just kind of mix. So I had a really cool musical upbringing. That's awesome. Yeah, but first music I ever made was in high school, with a, a group called Elevated Elements, and it was just like a rap group. Yeah. Yeah. So how like what year was that? Because was was hip the hip hop scene in Seattle pretty pre- prevalent at that point? Or? Yeah, this I mean I'm old. I'm forty now. So mm. damn, what year was that? It's like ninety seven. Mm. Yeah, ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight. I think that's the years we were in. I graduated in two thousand one, so maybe more like ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because I just had late nineties. I recently had Jake went on when he, he said when he started coming up there was not even really a scene. Like no. Sir Mixall was around, of course, but like yeah, no, but he the, had to just leave. They're before us. You yeah, know what I mean, and he's right. There was not much of like got it. Was like kid sensation and uh, uh, Sir Mix a lot and like a few people. Yeah, yeah. And like, were you inspired by them when you started making music, or like, what got you into wanting to become like a rap group? It wasn't, I don't, we weren't necessarily inspired by them. It's respect always because everyone knew like they were the first people in Seattle to like get recognized. Mm -hmm. But we were super inspired by like, like spiritual miracle kind of like backpack, like rap. Got it. (laughs) Like hieroglyphics and living legends. Hell yeah. I've had Dell Project Blowed and stuff like that. That's what we were like very inspired by. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. So did you go to college or what was? No, never went to college. I got right out of high school. I was in a rap group. Well, <clears throat> when Elevated Elements ended, I got I started a group with a couple of my friends called Clockwork, mm-hmm. and we were a group when I was started when I was a senior. So when I graduated, we made a demo. <laughs> How much time you got, man? You got time. <laughs> Damn, I never tell this story. Okay, so when I was done with call with high school, we we were working on a demo. I had a really good friend from Canada named Emo- his name's Emotions. Mm. Shout out to Emotions. Um, and I always used to work with him too. I have a, like a lot of friends in Canada. My cousin was uh, from Canada too. Mm-hmm. So when I was in high school, I used to catch the quick shuttle up to Canada a lot, and they were like nice. really on that battle rap. Like I learned a lot about stuff like that underground bat stuff from the Can- Canadian homies, my cousin and all these guys. So I would go back and forth between Seattle and Canada. Dang. Um, so emotions, who I met in Canada, was my cousin's friend. He somehow managed to get like a demo deal with DreamWorks. And DreamWorks, like the the, the um, movie DreamWorks? Well, no. they, that's the thing. People don't know. DreamWorks had a record label back in the early 2000s. That's wild. They had like uh, the Isley Brothers, uh, a group called Flowetry. I don't know if you remember them. They were tight. It's probably before your time. They were dope, though. Like Chris Rock was signed to their label. Like they had like a, a music department label. Wow. But there wasn't much going on with it. So they were trying to find stuff. And they were they offered Dave a demo deal. So Dave was like, if you can help me produce my demo record, I'll throw in the clockwork record just with my demo. I'll just put it mm. in there with, for you, like whatever. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, you know what I mean? So I helped him do his demo. And then we took the clockwork album that we had just finished and put it in there and sent it to DreamWorks. And they were like, oh, the clockwork album's fire. We want that. <laughs> and but we, then they were like, we want you to be in clockwork. Yeah. So they put Dave from Canada, Emotions, his name is Dave. They were like, you can be a part of clockwork, which was me and... Miguel Rockwell, you've probably seen yeah. him do, yeah. Yeah. Miguel was in Clockwork with me. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like he'll back up this whole story. <laughs> me and Miguel do uh, DJ sessions and stuff. Yeah, that's another Miguel. reason I, kn- I I know about you because Miguel has told me about you. Shout out Miguel. Yeah. I love Mr. That Rockwell, guy. like I have a lot of history with Miguel. That's amazing. Yeah, like this. So DreamWorks, would they like play your music on <laughs> in like DreamWorks movies or how did that? No, I never even got to that <laughs> point. This was like a straight record deal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um so they were like, what? And they were like, we're going to have DJ Quick uh, produce the record. Mm-hmm. So like, Damn. next thing we know, we're in LA with DJ Quick. And you're like fresh out of high school. Yeah, I'm like 20. That's amazing. Yeah. So I'm fresh out of high school. We do that. We do a record. 
all this stuff happens when they find out that there's been some funny business going on with Quick. He's been withholding stuff, apparently. Uh -uh. Record gets shelved. We just end up never doing anything. So it's like the kind of like a the, the classic record label, like, we got shelved story. Yeah. But we really came up because we soaked up a lot of game. We yeah. lived in L.A. for hell. I was around, like, some pretty crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot in that time, especially about the record industry and, like, just being around people. <laughs> so before before the DreamWorks thing, was music something you thought you could pursue pursue seriously? Or I did want to, yeah, because okay. we were pretty serious about Elevated Elements. Like, we were rapping mm -hmm. all high school. We all wanted to do music. Yeah. yeah. And did you guys do shows as the... Yeah. There we go. There's some good documentation of early element, Elevated Element shows. That's amazing. Three, four hundred people. Yeah. So how long was like the, the run with Clockwork Orange, even though you guys got shelved? How long was that like in we the We were a group for eight, nine years. Wow. We did three albums. We did the one album that Dreamers picked up, then we did two albums after that. Mm -hmm. so we did tour. We, we did a lot. Mm -hmm. we, we, we were able to live off of it, you know. It was a real group for nice eight a big chunk of time. So you guys were like able to tour and stuff, or we did a couple small tours, yeah. The Fast and Furious, the first movie they did, they did a tour, yeah. And we were like one of the opening acts on it. It was so funny, dude. With the Fast and Furious, like the movie, yeah, like Jin. You remember Jin, the rapper? No, he's this Asian kid. He was on Rough Riders. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. You remember him? Yeah, Battle Rapper. He yeah, went yeah. on 106 in Park and like had yeah, this yeah. big moment. He was like the headliner of it. What about like Ludacris? What Ludacris was in? Well, this is before. <laughs> Wait, Ludacris. Ludacris is like later on in yeah, the series. Yeah, before Ludacris. <laughs> I don't even think Ludacris had no records out this time. Dang. Or he might have been early, like real early time for Ludacris, but he was not a part of that at all. The Fast and Furious tour. That's insane. <laughs> Crazy, bro. This is in like 2003 or four, I think. Early. Dang. Yeah. Yeah, there was a time where like everything, like every movie had <laughs> like a, a video game attached or something exactly. attached to it. Exactly. They had a tour with the movie <laughs> and this is before anything like that was going on you Damn. know what i mean it was crazy we were like what for the movie <laughs> but it's because we were on dreamworks mm -hmm. and they were they were involved with the production and like releasing the movie so they tried to like mm -hmm. so is that still is dreamworks still around like the oh yeah dreamworks is definitely still a big movie company but the not the a record label anymore. record company went under a long time ago that's wild but do you think some people who are on that label were able to use that towards a pipeline to get into like sync deals or no we were like the only I think they were kind of trying to take a chance and trying to see if we, they could like find some like yeah. discover some group because like I said there was already like really established yeah group uh, people on the label so I don't I think it was like once they tried with us they were it, and it all like I don't think they did anything after that. Do you think there's like a DreamWorks documentary? There if there, could be. there if there is, you should be in it. <laughs> there could be. <laughs> no, no, I hope there's not. Oh my god, that's <laughs> wild. So it's when you guys when you guys got signed, did you guys get like an agent and a manager or yeah. was that okay? All that. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's how you were to get on like tours and things like that. Yeah, they the, we had a uh, lawyer named Jonathan Simpkin from, he's a Canadian lawyer, like music lawyer. Like yeah, you could probably look him up. <laughs> he's a funny dude, but he helped us like kind of navigate a lot of that stuff. So how did that work though? If like some of the members were in Canada and some were in the U.S., like did you guys did the guys from Canada move to the U.S. also? Yeah, once we agreed to do the deal, like they got a work visa, I think for. Got emotions it. and he was able to like come with us and just live down in LA. I think we were there for like a little over a year. So what is it? What does a deal look like for you at the time like that? It was I don't remember exactly, but it was crazy. It was like a four or five album deal, mm -hmm. big signing bonus, like stuff that doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah, yeah, like old record label stuff. Dang, that's yeah. wild. So you were with Clockwork for a few years, well, more than that's a long eight to <laughs> well, nine. That's not just a, a few years. We did a run. That's wild. Yeah. And during that whole time, were you guys in LA or did you move oh, back no. to Seattle? That was a quick stint. Okay. Yeah. Soon as that started to fall apart, we were back in Seattle. Got it. Yeah. And did you like? Do you have bad blood with DJ Quick then, or you guys? I always felt weird about that. Yeah. Yeah. He came like there's hella funny stories. He came to. Uh, I mean, it is what it is, but yeah. you know, I just feel like he could have handled it way more like professionally and looked at us like young bucks that he could have like fostered, but he just kind of like whatever the situation Dang. didn't really like. Yeah, I don't look back on that very positively. I bet <laughs> maybe one day you guys need to have like a. Uh, uh, in person like he's, mediation he's so yeah i'm sure he'd be like who are you bro damn you know I mean? that's like, wild literally it was that long ago though hey remember you messed up part of my life and then literally you don't even, that's wild we've talked about this but i've talked about this with mike before too like you think he would even remember that because i'm sure it's like a lot of stuff like that came his way through mm -hmm. through the through his the years of him being a producer Dang. he's one of the most legendary west coast producers yeah ever yeah so i imagine he's had a lot of scenarios like this through his life right 
So. And is can people still find your clockwork music? Is it good on yeah, streaming services? It's, it's searchable. Stuff? Cool. Yeah, you can search it. You have to I think you have to do kind of a deep dive, but if you put Seattle Clockwork Seattle, yeah, rap like that type of search. Yeah, you might something might pop up. I just listened to a, one of the albums the other day. So I know it's go. on. I know it's on a. Uh, I think it's on Spotify. That's wild. Yeah. So you went from your first group in in high school to Clockwork, and then what happened after that? Were you in another group? I did a. So, I had. I made so, some solo music for a while. Okay. Yeah, just I made. I had like an R and B mixtape that I did with Jay Moore, mm-hmm. Jonathan Moore. He's a Seattle legend. Mm-hmm. Rest his soul. Um, him and uh. B. Mello, who's actually a very classic Seattle DJ who was a host of Street Sounds on uh, KXP Street Sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where I did my first radio because Mello invited me to be like a little mini co-host. So I would nice. pop in and like be on the mic like in the corner and kind of like. So that was my first radio experience. That's awesome. So I asked Mello and Jay Moore to like host this mixtape for me. It was tight. It was like a R&B mixtape kind of. Got it. It's called the Launchpad Mixtape. I was searching for that the other day and I, yeah. couldn't, I couldn't find it. And what, what got you into R&B music? I've always liked singing and rapping, so that's Got more. It. it wasn't like arm, like Croner. It was more like singing and rapping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do you think that was always? Because that's not always been like a relevant thing, though, like singing and rapping. Like you no, when I was one. doing that, it wasn't. Be, people were like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. It was right around the time Drake started doing it. Okay. You know what I mean? Dang. I did that shit first, though. <laughs> Shout out! Let's have a Soldier Boy <laughs> interview. <laughs> No, Lace. I remember people were like, this Lace is singing? Because I grew up rapping, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So I was like, I want to start doing more melodic. I just like being melodic. Got it. So that definitely inspired me to just be like, let me try to sing and rap. Got it. Or like find a way to meld them. And then from that solo career, that led into the Flavor Blue? Or is there some, some music between, after, before, before that? It did, because <laughs> me and Parker started making music together. As solo artists, we just were like featuring on each other's stuff. Got it. And then we were like, we're pretty tired of making rap. Mm-hmm. It's just getting boring. So we wanted to like try to do some super experimental, like weird dance music. And that's what we did. Yeah. It's pretty tight. Yeah. We were just like, whatever, let's just try something crazy. And did you, you're a producer also. So yeah. like, were you produ- when did you start producing? I've been producing, I mean, since from the jump. Okay. When we were making elevated ele- beats for Elevated, we were on the NPC like making the beats. Yeah. So I've always been producing since I could. That's awesome. Yeah. So, do one of you guys in the Flavor Blue have like synesthesia or something? Or no one knows that word. Oh, you're like the first person ever bring that <laughs> up with Flavor Blue. That's cool, man. No, someone just threw that out to us. Wow. We had a name, like an actual, like we need a name for this trio, and the homie was like, "The Flavor Blue sounds tight," and we were like, "It does. It has no meaning." <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> What the? And you like took out the what, those consonants? I'm yeah, so there's bad. There's no O in flavor. Yeah. Yeah. Or A. F- right? No, it's F L A V R. I thought it was. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's just to be like hip, or we just wanted to be easily searchable. Got it. That's literally why we did it. We were like, because <laughs> we were like, if we do the flavor, it'll be like mint or like ever, so much stuff pops up. But if you skip the O and you put the R, like we <laughs> pop up. Yeah. And it did work. Yeah. Yeah. So like at that time, was it just when you linked up with them? Was it just a continuous? Like, were you just building off the hype you had earlier as an as an artist, or was it kind of like starting over when you guys formed a group? It was for sure starting over because it, it was the genre. Got like, it. if we had tried to stay on some rap stuff, I think we could have tried to like, but that's not what we did. We were we made like completely different kind of music, mm-hmm. so it did feel like we were kind of starting over. Got it. So you've you've always just been like enjoyed all types of music. Then it yeah. seems like now, that's cool. You man. had me thinking about this too. I'm like, damn, I have just been like, what do. There's like phases of it. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Because I don't like to be stuck on one thing. There's so much, there's just so much to try and do. Yeah. You know what I mean? I go through phases right now. Like I just randomly got off a kick of listening to like 2000s, late late 90s, 2000s, like punk music. Okay. You said punk. Yeah. Okay. Because I thought you said funk, which I also would have liked. But yeah. I love funk music. Like Motown. I just had, I do you know. James Brown all day yesterday. Do you know who Lee Fields is? Oh, come on, man. He just was on the show. It's coming out in like a week or two. What? Yeah. Oh, that's a great guest. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well done. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank He's you. He's a. It was a dope. fun interview. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Good guest. So, I just got off like, yeah, like late '90s, early 2000s, punk music, rock music. Yeah. And I just finished that kick, and now I'm into this like. <laughs> I think you can include her in this type. I don't even know the genre yet, but like, I like Grimes right now. You know Grimes, the rapper. She's like a. She's the one who she's you mean Elon like, Musk's. My 
heart will never be, will never. Have you heard that song? Maybe. I'm this is like I'm two days or three days into this music now. Was so, she married to Elon? That yes, one? yes, her. Yeah, that's that's my brother's. That that's my homie's sister. Yeah, Jay, Jay Worthy. Worthy. Yeah, Jay Worthy and me and him go way back. That's wild, man. I knew Jay before he rapped. Dang, because because you were in Canada or like yeah, he's <laughs> he's he's from Vancouver. Yeah, so you met him in Canada or do you meet him when he was in? Yeah, I met him like way back in the day. That's wild. Yeah. He was friends with Emotions, who I was talking about, who wow, got the clockwork deal. You see all this stuff ties world. together, bro? It's crazy. Dang. Yeah. So, like, she does, like, very experimental music, and then I don't think she's... She's spe- tight. Yeah, she is. I love her. I don't know if she's specifically in this genre I'm listening to her now, or if it just overlaps, but I'm, like, into this, like... It's just how I, I'm going to describe it. Just Someone knows the genre, but it's, like, yeah. super fast, like, almost, like, Japanese... Uh, electro electro music yep so i've been really into that <laughs> right now out that's of nowhere because you go where your heart takes you man yeah that's what's dope about music you can yeah. never stop if you want to you will continue to discover new stuff for forever yeah there's like literally endless things to offer for music but then what, what happens to people like people eventually just get stuck into like the music they like and that's why you get those people who are like i don't like that hip-hop shit or whatever you know what's funny i my friend <laughs> <laughs> like that hip hop shit. <laughs> my friend the other day, what? I'm not gonna say any names. My friend the other day, um, this was like on July 4th. I was gonna DJ my friend's family's barbecue. Okay. And I decided not to go because their uncle um, sent me a text and he was like, "Hey Blake, I heard you're interested in bringing some type of sound system over." And like he he obviously didn't even like even know the words for like the DJ tur- turntable mm-hmm. shit. Mm-hmm. And he's like. That's cool and all, but I just don't want you to like ghetto blast the neighborhood. And I was like, "What the?" He fuck? said, "Ghetto blast." <laughs> yeah. So I was like, "You know what?" What do you mean by that? Yeah. So I'm like, "Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna DJ your guys." <laughs> I think I'll fall back. <laughs> yeah. But but there's, there's people like that, like who just uh, think hip hop is ghetto blasting the neighborhood or some it's shit. Not, yeah. But I mean, I understand why people come do get tired because they haven't allowed themselves to like get outside of that mm-hmm. box. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's why we started Flavor Blue. I'm a hip hop head forever to my core, no mm-hmm. question. But I got tired of like doing it all the time and that like only consuming that. Right. Yeah. But what do you, do you think just people are, I guess the the more you're exposed to different music when you're younger, the more you're probably. That probably had something to do it. with it too. Got yeah. it. Because I listened to a lot. I knew there, I knew there was a lot to offer. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't know. I guess it's because you see on like, I was going to use Travis Thompson for example. Okay. I was looking at one of his posts, and I, you see this for any up, like newer artist. People will be in the comments being like, "I'm a 40 year old hip hop head, but I like this." You know, right, right. So right. I'm like, what "Why does that can't mean? yeah, like why can't you just like <laughs> hip hop yeah. or whatever?" I be, I do dissect things like that sometimes myself personally. Like, well, you didn't even need to say that. Just say you <laughs> like it. Yeah. Yeah, but also. If you feel the need to be like, I've been listening to this for a long time, and I, I still think this is good. I think that's more what that means. Yeah. But so you you, you and know. Parker met, and then how did Hollis get involved? Me and Parker were making, like, we were trying to make like house beats and like make like more electronic style stuff. Yeah. Um, and P- Parker's house where his studio was. <clears throat> pardon me. He his roommate was uh jeff dj hundred proof mm-hmm. you know dj hundred yeah he just released a great new mixtape. dj yeah he's a great dj yeah he is um great person too um but they're in like la right yeah he lives in la with hollis nice he, hollis because oh, they're dating or something they dated back then you know they've been dating for a long time yeah. now but they, they just started dating when flavor blue started 2011 or late 2011 early 2012 got it they just started dating so me and me and p are making beats and Hollis is like lingering around because she's with Jeff in the house because that's Parker's roommate. Mm-hmm. So she hears some shit we're doing and she just pops in like, what is this? And we're like, Dang. we don't know. And we're like, do you want to just sing on one and see what happens? And she did. And then we're like, oh. And it was like our first song. Wow. And then we're like, we should just keep doing this. And then that's, we just net, we, wow. that's where it started. It was kind of crazy. And was she making music at that time? or was that Yeah, like she was a rapper. Like she was oh, in wow. a group called uh, Canary Sing was the name of the rap group she was in it was her and this girl uh maddie wow they're like a rap a girl rap group duo and then i was told by who told me hmm. i think i could have the story completely mixed up something like did trisha like help you guys get a van to go on tour or something oh yeah yeah that's funny she did 
That's nice. <laughs> nice little tidbit there. I like that. Dang. You're doing your research. Yeah, so you did. so you you grew up with Ma- I met you at Macklemore's uh first time we met. And that's where I got my rose tattoo. Yep, and I got one too. Oh shit. You got a rose one? We got the same oh, one. Oh shit. Huh? Are you serious? Dang, we're like Where's tattoo brothers. I know we are, bro. <laughs> Dang. And we didn't even know. Wow. But it I mean it's not like super crazy. It's just like a ten flash to- tat <laughs> choice of seven. <laughs> <laughs> but that is still tight. We both went like this at the same time. And That's amazing. We made the same choice. <laughs> yeah, That's wild. Man. And um, then, so you you grew up with, around Macklemore or something, or how did that sh- connection? Not came? around him. That, that's my one of my oldest friends. Got it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, we went to literally the kindergarten. Wow. We started in kindergarten. Dang. It's crazy. We know each other a long time. And like, did you guys make music around the same time, or did one of you guys start first? We or? were in the ele- We were Ben was in Elevated Elements. Oh shit! Yeah, so me and that's ben, hilarious. I me had and no Ben idea. started our rap careers together. Yeah. Dang. And when we were like thirteen or fourteen. Wow. Yeah, Elevated Elements it was me, Ben, uh, Patrick O'Brien Smith, good friend of mine, and Zachary Self, and Frank Handler, who's they're all parents. They're all like, yeah. everyone has kids now. And do you have kids? Nope. What? Is that like you just don't want kids? or I'm 40. I, I, I guess. I, I feel like I've thought about it through a lot of my life, but it just ain't happened. Yeah. So now I'm like, I want to be like, it's got to happen soon. Yeah. My girlfriend knows it. <laughs> so we're going to see. The biological clocks and all that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Man, I don't stress about that, but I do think about it. Yeah. Yeah. But I have a great life, great quality of life, and I know a kid will change that a lot. Not to say it'll bring the quality down, mm. but I do really like having the time to pursue my dreams. Yeah, for sure. And not to say like having a, it's not bad to have, I mean, it's just like, I haven't done that yet. So yeah. I might as well focus on, use the time I have to focus on like pursuing things that I really care about. Yeah, that makes, my, my, uh, <laughs> you know, I think my dad had me when he was like either 40 or 41. Yeah, I've had a lot of homies that have had kids around 40, 45. So yeah, I, you know, it's, yeah, that's literally neither here or there. It is what it is, but it just hasn't. Yeah, it hasn't happened for me. Yeah, yet. we'll see. Maybe soon we'll. Maybe the next. No, I have a great girlfriend. So hell yeah, and that's I... always been a prevention in the past. Yeah, just not being ready to do that for sure. And yeah. so it's a it's a commitment. It's a lot. But maybe in the next few years we'll like we'll see how te- where technology gets. We us. could extend life. Extend too. life or yeah. cryogenically. Wait, no, cryogenically is freeze your body. Yeah, I don't like, want to freeze myself. Or like uh, freeze the kids, maybe though, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how things go. Like, I see your head's at. I see your head's at. Yeah. Yeah. You like tech, no music, so you got like futuristic stuff to a certain extent, right? That's <laughs> this goes hand in I hand. I really like techno. I, like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say that. I'm gonna need Wait, what know. is techno? Am I listening to techno? Is that Japanese stuff techno? What is tech? Is techno even like a common? Is, is people say that anymore? Whatever it is, I don't like it. Okay. Techno, I don't. It's just more like when I think of techno, I think more of like a German like warehouse deep in the woods like with like guys with no shirts like like do, like well no then that's like techno to me like like techno is just annoying that sounds like an incel thing <laughs> 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 guys making drum and bass in the middle of the woods in germany with their shirts off <laughs> oh i don't know where that one came from man you know that it's, it's I, just, I got an image now, so I don't think I want to listen to techno. Yeah, I don't know. I just I've never liked techno. I've love like I love music. I love electronic. I love house music. I love got certain it. types of electronic music, and techno is a type of electronic music. But yeah, do you like? Do you like? It's never been for me. Do you like tuxedo? Oh yeah, that 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 that's that's like musical. Like yeah, that's real music though. Yeah. So you as the Flavor Blue, you guys released three albums together, correct? Yeah. And what was what was the what was the end like for that? Was it just like everyone grew up or not? Grew, mm-hmm. grew up sounds bad. Like just had other things in their lives. No, I keep or was it one hundred? The end was Parker having a kid and getting married. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> pretty much the end of that. Mixed with COVID, yeah. Like the, all those things happened for him right around the same time. Got it. So like, it was yeah like. I, the, he, it, there was never even really a discussion. And the thing right. isn't, there's never been a discussion, so I don't really think it's ended. Right. It's just like, we're not doing that no more. Right. But if P and Hollis came to me and were like, you want to work on it? I'd be like, yeah, let's work on it. I'd be down. Yeah. It was never like, we're done. Because you guys all do like, like still me- like art or media yeah, stuff. Yeah, we're all still active. So. Yeah. P's been off the grid because he's had two kids in the last like two years. Yeah. So he's like really started a, a whole family. Mm-hmm. 
So, yeah, I'm like, there's he doesn't even have time to do that. Right. So I think I don't know. It really depends on like how when people release music but from my understanding well just from spotify and all that the last song that i saw was like a feature with jay park but i don't know how old that was, that was it was released in 2019 yeah that's that's like yeah a while ago Got that's it. probably our last big release mm-hmm. that we did because that song was pretty big it had yeah not a lot of attention because jay park is jay park time like a... jay park was i don't even he's like kind of retired from music yeah he just retired he pops back in when he wants you know what i mean jay's a fool yeah he's a cool cat man that's cool. always really like jay humble cat hella hella humble but like very successful yeah, man. He's like, like got Uberly South successful. Korea in his palm of his hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's like the type of artist that people like cry if they stop. Oh yeah. Music. When you're yeah. around Jay and you see like how famous he really is, yeah. that's when you're like, Oh damn. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, cool though that he like continued to make music with like Seattle. I always people. respected that about him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he made it a he made uh he made it a point to yeah. do that and he didn't have to. So. Is that important for you like you to like stay connected with the Seattle community? Very. I mean I'm born and raised here. I'm a Seattleite. Mm-hmm. I see the city changing a lot, so I do think it's important. A lot of people leave, and I don't blame them. Yeah, but I do think it's important for Seattleites to stay too. Yeah, and make sure that they can represent the city like for what they know it was and can be. For sure. <laughs> and you're definitely like anyone that's like a host at KXP is kind of like a community leader, in my opinion. I'd say. That, well, thanks. You know, so yeah. like, what are some? I guess, I guess it's easy to say like negative things people have seen change in Seattle but I like to ask like what are some positives you may have seen change in Seattle I like that because that's never asked Mm. (laughs) um good question man I feel like like this is inevitable you know what I mean like as long as humans are like here and Mm. they're making more money and they're more active like things are going to grow and it's like you can't stop it really you know what I mean it's kind of inevitable for humans to just keep evolving in some type of way. So I try to see the positives in like stuff like Amazon and that type of stuff. They brought a lot of people yeah. to the city that I never would have met before. They brought a lot of like Africans and Indians and a lot of immigrants that I wouldn't have met before. Right. You know what I mean? So it's in this weird way, they kind of add, it kind of adds to the ethnic pool. Mm hmm when you have a hub of something like that, which Got is it. like, isn't it? It's kind of weird, huh? Yeah, definitely. Does it make sense? It's yeah. Think about it, like, I think it's allowed. Sorry to cut you off. Cause no I worries. have a good thought. My bad. Um, but it's allowed like ex- the Afrobeat scene has really grown. I think because there's so many more Africans in the city Yeah. because of these job opportunities and things that have came from the city, like kind of becoming whack. Which, yeah. One way you look at it, even thinking like the food culture in Seattle, there's a lot of like, uh, Asian influences, hella, Ethiopian restaurants, hella. like, yeah, and authentic. Yeah, because it's not like it's them making it. Yeah, for the most part, that is a plus. I'd say that's cool that's if you if thing. you like that type of food. But well, also, it's I just like, like the culture. Diversity. Yeah, you know? and Seattle's always been a little bit void, devoid of culture. It's always had dope culture, mm-hmm. but I'm telling you, you look at the percentages. Yeah, you know, it's just like not. It's a pretty white city. Mm-hmm. Always has been. And but now you're you're the Afrobeat DJ in on KXP, so. Before that, were you also just DJing? Yeah, or, I was okay. DJing a lot. I was doing a lot of Afrobeat stuff before mm-hmm. I got the KXP gig. But before that, me and Parker were doing a lot of Flavor Blue gigs, getting DJ gigs. Got so it. that's really where I started to learn and be like, yo, you, like DJing is like, you can really make money and like it can be a profession. Yeah. And it's way easier than setting up an entire show of m- like musical instruments. Yeah. And stressing about singing and being off key on this note and missing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you DJ, you can just vibe. Yeah. Just kick it and play good music. Mm-hmm. It's a great job. Yeah. For sure. That's awesome. Do you like do you ever do like mixes with Afrobeat where you're mashing up songs at all? I or? haven't done any of that. Okay. Well. I'm a purist. I'm like real old school with that. Okay. Yeah. People ask me that. Why don't you release mash why don't you do mashups or release like your mixes or like do and I'm just like, I don't ever I'm not I'm I don't think about that shit. I'm just like if I'm yeah. doing it, I'm doing it then. Yeah. And that's when it's for and I'll do another one later. That's awesome. So <laughs> when did uh so you after like you started making like money and thinking you could become a uh, an artist, was did DJing just fall into that as well, or did you ever think that DJ was going to take off for you, where you're going to become like a KXB host? And you know, I never would have saw that coming. Got it. Yeah, it was more of just like a fun. I was like, yo, I'm getting some gigs. Yeah, DJing and it's fun. Like I should actually start to like take this a little more serious and see if I can kind of get into this lane more. Mm-hmm. And that's where I knew Afrobeat. I was like, I'm kind of one of the only people playing this music, so why don't yeah. I like really focus on this? 
I just found out I'm half African. It's really fun for me to do it. I like spreading the culture. Yeah. I was like, let me just, this is a good lane. Let me do this. That's awesome. Yeah. And how did the KXP thing come about? Gabe, Gabe Teodros, who just quit yeah. his job. Oh, he, he did? Yeah, he has the morning show, but he quit. From like? He stepped away. Like, quit's usually like intense. Like, they didn't. No, it's not intense. He got a job offer to teach. Oh, wow. So he's, in, he's like, I want to be a teacher. Dang. So he took the job up. And he's uh, making music again, so he's like, "I'm gonna start working on yeah, music." Yeah, because he raps. Exactly. So he he told what he told me is, "I'm taking a dope job up. I'm gonna I'm gonna start teaching and I'm gonna start working on music again." I was like, "Okay, hey, like, dope." You know what That's I mean? Awesome. Good for him. So, um, but yeah, speaking of Gabe, he when he was working there during the pandemic, they were trying to change their like mission statement and do like some hype because they were just like, "We need like new fresh faces in mm -hmm. here." It's just kind of like getting stagnant. Yeah. And Gabe was like, oh, well, I just saw, I had seen, <laughs> see things tied together so crazy. I was DJing an event for Hollis because <laughs> she was at Sugar Hill where I told you I did my first Afrobeat nights. Yeah. But she knows the owner of Sugar Hill. So she was doing something at Sugar Hill uh, for her first solo stuff. Yeah. And I, she asked me to DJ it. So I came and DJ it and I was playing Afrobeat. I just got back from Senegal. I was really almost on my Afrobeat. It's like right after I got back from Africa. So I was like, I'm about to play hella African music like everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and Gabe was there. And he was like, bro, what are you playing? And I was like, what? What do you mean? Like, Because <laughs> Gabe's African. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he's Ethiopian. So it's like really, it's funny how segmented it, because like sounds are really different right. depending on where you are. So he hadn't heard the type of like African music I was playing. Yeah. And I was like, bro, it's, it's like, it's popping right now, like Afrobeat, like Wizkid, like check out this guy, Burner Boy, he's really like interesting. It was like before they had gotten big, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And he was like, oh, bro, you should submit a, just do a mix, like can you do like a janky, like just pretend you're doing a radio show, like and just like send it in to me and I'll just send it in yeah. to my bosses because they're looking for new content. They want new shows right now. And I was like, what? <laughs> all right like you know what i mean i was like yeah i guess that's a great opportunity i yeah, guess so yeah. let me figure it out i like figured out how to get the mic in my house and like <laughs> so you, did, you did the voiceover did, and stuff too i did the most <laughs> i still have it it's so janky <laughs> but they they but i did a good job it's yeah. just like the sound quality is not where but they didn't care about that they just wanted to see like how it would feel if yeah. i was presenting as like a because i was like wait you want me to talk he's like yo just do a little demo of a radio show so mm -hmm. i did they sent it in they're like yeah we want this as a show Wow. So then I was just like, oh. Like, next thing I know, I'm just like a DJ at KXP with wow. my own show. <laughs> That's And wild. one of the only Afrobeat shows on major public radio, like KXP level in the States, for sure. There's, only, I think Damn. mine's one of the only one, might be the only one. Wow. There's man. definitely other Afrobeat people doing, you know, their internet radio stuff, but just like a, a platform like KXP, there's no, there's no, I don't think there's any dedicated Afrobeat shows. Wow. Yeah. Like NPR doesn't have one, uh, you know. Yeah. Stuff like that. So, from my understanding, when from what I know, when artists want to, artists can submit their music to KXP for yeah. host to play. Do you ever have you found any like Afrobeat artists in Seattle? No, not really. Wow, a couple, but not really. There's no, yeah, mm. that that there's no like Afrobeat industry in Seattle for sure. Not right like, music industry. And what yeah. makes an Afrobeat a good like? What makes a good Afrobeat song? A good Afrobeat song? Yeah. I don't think there's anything particular. It's just like, oh, it's just, is it good or not? You yeah. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't really, like, yeah, I'm just like, is it good or not? Yeah. Yeah. And then how do you, how do you find your Afrobeat music? I, to my show, I take a lot of pride in, like, trying to play artists that aren't as big mm -hmm. or, like, give artists premieres that have, haven't been played in the States yet. Mm -hmm. So I do their, uh, you know, there's a U.S. premiere. Yeah. Because I know it's a big deal, like, to get that on your resume and stuff. I remember when Flavor Blue was doing stuff, and it was like, whoa, we're about to get radio play and for the first time here. Like, it was mm -hmm. a big deal. So I'm like, let me, if I can create that for other people. So I've focused on that a lot for the show. So I've discovered a lot of, like, super random, dope African music. Heck, yeah. That's one of the best parts about my show. And I've, I've asked other KXP it's hosts, but what is, what is, like... In your opinion, what is the importance of radio in a time where everything's changing with streaming services? And... It's yeah, it is important because it's live, you know, hmm. live radio where it's real DJs. I think it's really important, like because people you'd be surprised. Like working at KXP, I've really learned how much of a crutch the radio can be for people's like emotional well-being hmm. and like not being not feeling like they're alone, like super lonely, right? 
because if you have you can type in you can write into people they'll respond you know what i mean like you can get to know the djs it's just like a dope outlet yeah for a lot of different reasons and do you have like a memorable experience of being at kxp so far many a lot but yeah stuff like that mm -hmm. people that have write, written written into me like the first couple weeks i was doing the show and then like now they're like like my for example i have this dude will he's like one of my best friends now he nice. rode into the show maybe the first couple weeks i went to paris to visit him wow you know what i'm saying like and he took me around and showed me the dopest app like it was just wow. and i'm like this is literally because you wrote me an email on my show and kept in touch every week you'd be like i'm locked in i'm locked in like really became a real supporter of my show so me i was like man this guy is really so we became friends that's awesome you know what i'm saying and now we're like really good friends because kxp it's, it's syndicated for sure right yeah well i i don't know honestly that's a good ass question i don't know mm. it's public radio so i don't know if that's even a thing that can happen huh by syndicated exactly what like like you're able to people are able to hear it how, how did the guy will hear it if oh, he lives in because Paris? It, it's there's a so there's still use the streaming they okay. use a streaming app yeah ksp branding is i don't think anyone else is running our broadcast i think it's happened before but not Got it. it has to be like a very specific like team up okay you know what i mean our their branding is just wild yeah they've been a, a notable station for so long yeah lee i think lee fields has had he's a couple performed there many times yeah yeah and charles bradley charles bradley is like one of my favorite uh when they're in the coffee shop He's got, there's a one, yeah, like where he's on the stage and yeah. right in front of Vita. Yeah. And he's just dripping sweat. Yeah. Yeah, that one is so tight. He was a, yeah, that dude was a G. Yeah. Lee, his soul. Lee told me that he took Charles on his first European tour too. Yeah. So that was a cool story here. That's dope guy. Like looking out for his fellow soul yeah. brother. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So what is, uh, if you if you become like a KXP host, are you automatically going to be able to do live performance hosting as well? Or how does that work? It is. It opens it up so you can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to ha you have to be on the radio to host a live mm -hmm. from what I am aware of. Yeah. And how did how did you start? Because you've, you've done a few of those. Like, do you choose the they artists it, you want to do that? Or it's do dope. They make they just basically make you can just if you're a, if you have an idea for an artist or, you know, an artist might be coming through that could it would make sense. There's a form and you mm. can just submit. It's basically DJs are just open to always submit artists that they think would be good to perform. That's which awesome. is why KXP has so much dope. Like the the discovery on KXP is crazy, because yeah. there's always good ideas of like bands. Let's check out this one. Let's bring them in. So yeah, there's some crazy like like Denzel Curry had one. I know, Lady bro, Ray they, had one. If you start digging in the KXP archive, yeah. the YouTube, it's like they've literally had everyone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Dell's done one too. I'm pretty sure. I think Dell did one. Yeah. In the old building, the Dexter building. Yeah. Yeah. But then, like, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you have like a favorite band or artist that you've hosted a live performance for? One that I've hosted. Mm -hmm. Man, because I'm I'm personally connected to most of them because I'm like got it. I'm 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 championing. I'm I'm rooting for them, trying yeah. to get them, and then when they get it, I'm like yeah yeah. So I, it's like they're all favorites of mine. Honestly, like they're all people I've that's fair went to bat for to try to get you know. What about what's your favorite that you've seen then? Favorite one I've seen? Probably the one I just did, Salty Saul. They're like a big group from Kenya. Okay. They're a huge group from Kenya. And they were like, they had, I noticed that they had, they had no, like they just rocked it. No auto tune, Dang. no funny stuff. Like they were like really just singing. And I was like, these guys are really talented. And it was nice to be in there to hear it. Like, yeah. Because I'm so used to hearing like a little bit of affected vocals. Like most people have something on their. Yeah. And these guys were just singing like on some R and B like doo wop type, mm -hmm. just perfectly in key. Like I was like, oh no wonder these guys are really like that's awesome respected. And that was nice to be able to hear it live. And do you guys have multiple rooms, or is it like one specific room that you there's just do one all? big room where they have wow. all the lives? It's had a lot of bands in it. That's cool. Yeah. And is it like soundproofed, or what is it? What's it yeah. like in there? Yeah, it's a dope KXP's. The whole campus is yeah. dope. It's that's a big super space. cool. Yeah. So the last time when I first met you at um, the, the Christmas party, I think you were headed to Africa for something KXP related, or yeah, I was going to Senegal and I did the first live broadcast that KXP's ever done from Africa. That's wild. Dope notch on my belt. I was pumped about that. Yeah, and they really like facilitated me doing it, which was dope. Dang. So is that is that a uh, a bridge you're trying to continue to build? Yeah, because now that I've done that, I know how to. Take, it's like a small little rig they sent me with, and I know I can like broadcast with it. So now, if I'm going places, I can always just be like, 
this is going to be this this time it'll be this from this place dang that's awesome i know it can work other places now that's awesome wait so what is your like what is your sleep schedule like then if it's like a you said you have a 1 a.m show yeah what is that like that 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 was one thing i was like oh because as a dj yeah <clears throat> um doing a show at one in the morning is like totally killed my friday night like yeah. possibility to get gigs on friday nights so that was kind of a bummer but I've always been a night owl, so that didn't really mess with me. But, you know, getting home at 4 and getting to sleep at 4.30 does kind of yeah. mess with you the next day. But I you get used to it, honestly. And then, so you bring in, like, a turntable or a mixer? Or I bring in like? my setup, yeah. Cool. It's tight to be able to really DJ. That's awesome. On and you, you DJ at other places. Do you have any, like, residencies at other places? Or where else do you DJ? I, I've had a couple, like, Trap House was a residency. I had a thing called uh, Champagne Day. It was, a, it was a residency in Bellevue. Mm. And it was, like, one of, I was so proud of that thing. That's wild. Um, it was like a very upscale. Everyone came very dressed up. It was like a cool African event in in Bellevue. That's crazy. And it was like super. Not many people knew about it, but like if you did, you went. Yeah. So it was always full, but it never got like spoiled. You yeah. Know what I mean, so that was something I was very proud of. Um, I've had a thing called Tune for Tune at Numos, which is all based on just like dancing. I just put the dancers on because they're a big part of the Afrobeat culture. Yeah. And they get forgotten a lot of the time. Um, and I'm Q nightclub is where I'm, I'm like really focusing on my nights at Q. I have an Afro house thing at Q. It's called Afro house. That's awesome. And it's more like Alma piano house music, African house music. Dang. It's been going really well. It's tight. That's wild. So you just have a crazy resume building. I'm, I'm working. I'm definitely working. But I'm also like super low key. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like I'm not, not doing too much, right. but I'm working. Yeah. Yeah. And like, are you dabbling in music still at all? Or yeah. what is that like? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to studio tonight. I just started getting back in the studio. I just want to start producing. I want awesome. to take my stab at like making African music, producing African music. That's cool. And I have done it a couple of times. I had a couple of releases the past few years with a few artists that I became friends with. So I know it's doable. I just mm -hmm. have to like, I haven't locked in on music in a long time. I've yeah. been focused on DJing. And other like up and coming artists that you've been looking at, like, whether it's Afrobeat or just in the city or outside of the city, even mm, there is a there's a lot that I'm I don't want to say too much early because mm -hmm. there's a few things <laughs> I just don't. There's a couple artists I'm working with, but I can't say it yet. Yeah. So, but yes, I'm working. I'm already working with a couple artists. Yeah. That I'm really excited about. That's awesome. Yeah. So, what does it take for? I feel like some DJs can get like stuck in their ways, like the music they're playing or the crowd they're connecting with. Like, what do you do to? You stay like fresh and still understand what's going on in the community. That's a good question. You just have to get out to comfort. You, you can't be too comfortable when you're DJing. I like to always feel uncomfortable when I'm DJing somehow. Mm -hmm. That means I'm playing some record that no one knows and I'm just going to see how they're going to react to it. Mm -hmm. And like, I might get the death stare, or, like the, the energy might <laughs> drop. And then that's, that's what I, that's the price I paid for doing that. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I like that experience because I'm like, Oh, now this is how I learn. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's something I pay attention a lot to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think it was Clock Out Lounge where Miguel had like a drummer in the background or something yeah. too. That was pretty cool to see yeah, that Yeah, that's thing. cool. They've been doing those things. Uh, Aaron Walker. Aaron, the drummer. Yeah. And so we do it with an Avi. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about that thing? Yeah. Yeah, that was dope. The branding they had for that was hella funny too. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a good idea. Like that's a good, a lot of uh, Amo Piano artists and Afrobeat artists do that. They'll have like a little drummer yeah. while the, the DJs will have like they'll bring the homie and he'll just be drumming kind of in the mm -hmm. back are there any like uh african like programs that you've noticed in seattle that you feel like if people want to get more involved with like afro african dance music? seattle okay i highly recommend afro dance seattle that's my sister kine kamara she's also half me and her like that's my run that's like my partner in crime that's awesome her dad senegalese her and her mom's white just like we're like the same mix yeah and we like found each other in seattle it's so rare wow so me and her just went to senegal this together this last time wow it's a really dope trip. How many times have you been to Senegal now? Maybe five, four or five now. Dang. Yeah. Since 2007 is the first time I went, and wow. I've been going, trying to go at least three, every three or four years. Heck yeah. And I've been a lot. The past, I've been three times. Yeah, no, maybe more than that. I can't even remember. It's wow. a lot. We go a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. But I guess that is one thing that not having kids allows you to do. Exactly. So there's, a, there's some pros. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I wouldn't be able to do that for sure. Not. <laughs> yeah. That's not happening. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? Well, this has been a fucking amazing conversation. It's been great to like learn yeah. more about your background, man. Thank you for having and me. I, I appreciate what you do as a DJ. And Thank you. With that, what is what is some final advice you have for up-and-coming artists, creators, influencers? 
I think just stay true to your like what you do because if you're having fun when you're creating, it really does matter. I feel like mm -hmm. I don't know how cliche that sounds, but I've just noticed through my career I've tried to like force a lot of stuff, and then usually when I let go, I'm like, let me do what I'm gonna have fun doing. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, all the opportunity starts coming. Like Hell yeah. I'm just when I'm like, you know what, I'm not gonna cater to nothing except being like authentic in what I'm gonna present and make sure it's fun. Yeah. I also feel like you're getting, you get burnt out if you're not having fun with what you're doing. And then you like, you know, you know, the stereotype of like, you quit, you, you quit a day before the record label is going to like reach out to you or whatever, you know? Exactly. <laughs> like, don't even allow that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Challenge yourself to have fun. Yes. hundred percent. You know what I mean? And with my that, guy. my guy, what, the, what is the easiest way for people to reach you and check out your stuff? I'm, I'm an Instagram guy at Lace Cadence. So that's L-A-C-E-C-A-D-E-N-C-E, -E -E, Lace Cadence. You can check out my show. Uh, I usually have a link to my show on my Instagram, mm -hmm. but you can go to kexp.org and just search Overnight Afrobeats. That's going to change soon because I'm going to have to change the name of the show. <laughs> uh, but I'll be moving to 7 to 10 p.m., which is a big move for the show on Friday night. So I look forward to that. That's awesome. Yeah, man. And I'm around the city. Hell definitely. Yeah. Pretty much Instagram, if you want to know what I'm doing, the events, all that stuff is usually on my gram. So. There we go. This is the NAS Podcast with... Lace Cadence. And we did it. <laughs>